To make a start with the actual program for today, yesterday we had a really interesting session on opening up Poland, and today we're going to broaden the scope to Europe, opening up Europe. So our keynotes are three well-known speakers. We have uh, Jan Gondol from Slovakia, Anke Mulder from the Netherlands, and Lisa Blaschke from Germany. I'll be introducing each of them in, term, in uh, turn. The speakers will have about approximately 20 minutes for their talks, and that will leave us time for questions and answers at the, at the end, and hopefully some lively debate. They'll be approaching the topic from different uh, but closely interrelated uh, perspectives, political issues, social issues, and the importance of collaborating and networking. So, our first speaker is Jan Gondol, who worked for the Slovak government in 2014 and 2015. During this time, he was a manager of the Comsod Open Data Project at the Ministry of Interior and was responsible for Slovakia's open data commitments under the Open Government Partnership, OGP, umbrella. He also introduced the theme of open education in the country's OGP Second National Action Plan and drove the initiative to build foundations for OER policy and open access policy in Slovakia. He's now working with several organizations to promote open data, open education, and open source software. When you're ready. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. Uh, so the reason why I'm speaking to you today uh, in this panel, Opening Up Europe, we started with Opening Up Poland, now we are going to Open Up Europe. Uh, with in a, in a thread session, we will open up the universe, or, or mind of the universe. Uh, so Slovakia did some, uh, some important steps uh, in, in introducing open, open education and uh, in open government partnership. Uh, in this first presentation, we will have a big picture view, and then we'll dive into some very specific ways uh, of, of uh, how openness plays out. But first of all, uh, why even care about openness? Why is this something we should even discuss? Well, uh, it's, there's many ways to look at it, and one, one of the ways is uh, to look at it through the issue of power. Who is it that has, who is it that, that has power? Those uh, who have access to information, those have access to power. And uh, this is something that, that we really understand well uh, in, in democracies. We, we, we know that unless there is openness, unless there is free flow of information, unless there is access to information, it's really hard to, uh, to, to have a democracy. And this is something really important uh, uh, in, uh, in open, open government as such. We have seen some examples uh, during the past couple of weeks of what it means when there is not openness, when, when there is a lot of secrecy. We heard about the Panama Papers. And uh, this is oftentimes the way we look at uh, access to information. It's, uh, it's through the prism of transparency, uh, of fight against, uh, fight against corruption. When we release information, when we release data on what's going on, um, there are, are, are certain benefits. And uh, some, some years ago, uh, there was discussion about, about open data. Uh, you heard in, in, uh, in, in the introduction that I was, I was responsible for some uh, open data activities in Slovakia. And we, and we realized that data itself is, is not enough, that there's uh, a lot more that we can do in terms of openness. And that is why we started working on open education. But first, let me start by, uh, by saying why uh, open data is, is uh, considered uh, is useful. And, and when, you s when you communicate with, with policymakers, um, they, they understand certain benefits of, of open data through their eyes. There's many ways why open data is seen as beneficial, and uh, the easiest one is, you know, money. When data is released, it can be used in new and innovative ways, which means that there are high-quality jobs that are created, very interesting data-driven jobs. Um, when there are companies that, that are started uh, that work with data, uh, they pay taxes, which makes policymakers, politicians happy. And, um, and this is something that they understand very easily. Also, uh, there is the issue of fairness. When data is released, uh, people, people get access. And sometimes politicians are scared, well, when we release data, 
and people just start downloading it. What happens? You know, our servers will go down, and we will not be able to to serve them. Well, uh, you see, on, in, in this picture, there are multiple boxes. You know, one box can be given to the government, so people can still have good access to data while sharing with everybody else. There is the issue of of friction. Uh, we have some friends from, from the Czech Republic, and in the Czech Republic, um, there was a study uh, conducted where, where they actually looked at uh, how much money it costs to administer when data is served commercially, you know, when you just give it to some organizations that apply, they pay a fee, uh, and, they, and they looked at uh, what, what happens, what the financial flows are. So in order to make, uh, you know, 20,000 euros, you oftentimes have to spend 20,000 or more just to administer um, all, uh, all the paperwork around it. So politicians understand that when they release data, um, they, uh, they actually do not, they do not gain a lot when they, when they try to just withhold it. And today we understand that uh, unless we release the data, unless we make it open and we make it available on the web, uh, we are losing out because the next issue is uh, being, being you know, future-friendly or forward-looking. Uh, the, next, the next web will be built on data. And just like we, we heard yesterday in, in, in the panel opening up Poland, uh, we heard that it's really, really important to have the building blocks or Lego blocks. So all of this, all of this was about data so far. In a moment, I will connect that to, uh, to educational resources as well. Uh, we got to the point when it is generally understood that you know, there are benefits to open data. And the last thing is, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really awesome uh, that data is being released. And uh, it's just, today it's just the hip thing to do. Some of you will recognize Alec Tarkovsky in this picture. It's a little dark, but uh, you will, you'll probably, you'll probably uh, still recognize him. Uh, today, releasing data is just, you know, if I can use the emotional words, freaking awesome. So we, we talked about 5F, uh, financial value. There was, uh, there was the issue of fairness. Uh, there, was, there was the issue of removing friction. And uh, it's just, it's just uh, really freaking awesome. So there, there are uh, many more arguments to think about open data and their value, the way they are brought to the society. These were just five examples of how we can open for data. But now you're probably thinking, uh, what in the world is this person talking about? Uh, this, is, this is a conference about education, right? It's not an open data conference, it's an open education conference. Uh, what we have done in our national action plan, we basically work with the policymakers who already recognized the many benefits of open data, uh, some of which I, I just introduced. And we try to make a link, just saying, okay, it's really, transparency is really, really important uh, for, for the functioning society. It's really, really important that we, that we fight corruption. You know, the things we, we talked about in the beginning. All of those things are absolutely crucial. But why do we stop there? Why should we stop there? There's a lot more that the government is doing. There are a lot more services that the government is providing. And those should be open as well. I mean, there's, there's so much value in there as well. So basically the argument that we build, and there are many ways to, to build the argument for policymakers, we basically said, you already recognize the value of open data. Uh, you already know how much it can do to the society. You already know that this is beneficial. And there's so much more that the government does. Let's, let's open up those areas as well. So there are some, some obvious, obvious places where we can move on. You know, there's data, but there's also content that we also pay for with public money. You know, data is created with public money. Uh, public money is spent on a lot of other things as well. And one of them, uh, one of them, is content, whether it's educational content or all kinds of other content. And, um, and there's software. The government pays a lot for all kinds of e-government systems, uh, all kinds of other software systems. So basically what we have done, uh, we said, let's not stop there. Some people are really scared when you talk about, you know, when the, gov when the government uh, pays for software that it should be released openly under an open source license. Even people who are fighting this and, and who are saying, you know, if you, if you are releasing source openly, you are building communism, uh, which is perceived as a negative thing uh, in, in this part of the world. You're just doing the wrong thing by, uh, by releasing open source. Well, uh, 
there's there's an argument that we can that we can make that it actually makes a lot of sense to to release the source and uh, we can build on what we have already done with data and it's same thing uh, with education and educational resources the government uh, provides education uh, in, in many countries it's one of the key government services and many times the government pays directly for the creation of educational resources but they are not available for uh, for people uh, to, to reuse if you just if you just say all right um, I would love to get access to uh, to um, materials that are being taught at, at public university public through my taxes uh, I would love to just see what's happening there I'd like to access the content many times you can I'm a parent I have a, a four and a half year old daughter and uh, when she goes to school and I will want to obtain a copy of what she's learning because I'd be, I, I would like to see what's going on, I'd like to make a copy in my phone, um, I cannot legally do that. And it's kind of, it's kind of weird because uh, this, is, this is resource that was directly financed uh, through public money. So just like this poster says, sometimes it's easier to just buy, buy a gun than just to buy education. Oftentimes, what happens, uh, there is revolt from the established players, from those who provide services in the old model, and they say, uh, if you release uh, content openly, if you release software openly, you know, the, there was going to be a, a huge problem in the society, just like we see in this comic, um, when, uh, when joking about you know, sharing of the bread, uh, the person selling bread is saying, well, the damn piracy will kill the bread industry. So uh, oftentimes what, what the publishing industry says, well, if you just allow sharing, uh, you know, this will, this will kill uh, the publishing industry or, or the software people say this will kill the software industry. So oftentimes you get this kind of re reaction from, from uh, the established players. But there is argument to be made Whenever there is a public good, we could say, you know, the public should enjoy the benefits. When there's public funding, there, this, the, the results should be treated as, as, as a public good. When we build sidewalks, uh, or when we invest money uh, uh, for, for goods, that are, goods that are supposed to be enjoyed publicly, um, it's, it's so much better to just let, let, let people use them. And we should extend this from data, which we have already done, to, uh, to software and education as well. Uh, there is an analogy between how data works and um, how, what we can do with, with educational resources. If you've ever been to an uh, open data talk, you probably saw, uh, saw this a number, number of times. Um, in open data, there's a five-star system, which you, some of you may have heard about. And it's just like with hotels. Uh, when you go to a five-star hotel, you, you probably expect that it's going to be better than a two-star hotel. And it's similar with, uh, with data. So uh, the first step is to have data that's openly licensed. The first step is just to put it on the web in any form. Just make it available. The second step uh, is to have uh, data available in a machine readable format. So while it's nice to have at least a photograph of something, you know, it's, it's the first step. It's, it's one star. Uh, even if it's just a photo of something, even if it's just, you know, something that you cannot edit at all, just make it available. Uh, that's the first step. Second step is make it machine readable. Uh, so if you save it, let's say, in, in a Microsoft Excel file, it's, it's a little better than just, you know, a little photograph of, of your data. And then uh, make it available in a non-proprietary -pro format. It's a third step, a third step, uh, so that you do not have to purchase a certain, certain program to be able to, to, to read that. Then uh, there are certain standards uh, to make this data uh, available in such a way that you can interconnect them across the web. So we start with data in any format whatsoever. Then we keep improving unless, un un until we have you know, better open data and then uh, data that can be used as a building block of, of the web. And we can do, you, you can use, we can use a similar framework for thinking about uh, educational resources. We can start you know, with making uh, things at least available. That's the first step. 
and then we can keep improving, uh, improving the educational resources to something better, just like with the data. So we could say that we could have a framework. This is a beta version, something that you know is, is a uh, starting point for a starting point for a conversation. We could have data available uh, on the web with a free license. So as long as as, as this is fulfilled, uh, we have one start uh, open educational resources. If, if those educational resources are uh, in an open and editable format so that you know they can be reused, we could say that this could be two star educational resources. Then when we, when we make that, uh, those resources accessible and uh, we, we add metadata to them so we can figure out what's inside and we can, and we can um, share them in, uh, in digital libraries. We could say these are three-star resources. And then the next step would be to make them available in a web-native format so they could be displayed on any device. The reason why, if you, if you type any address in your, into your phone or tablet or laptop, the reason why you'll be able to, uh, to, to see a web page or website, it's because it will be in HTML. Uh, so it's a standard. You can open it on anything. And then uh, we can move to the final step, which is you know, making, making content discoverable in those atomic pieces. Like if I want uh, to teach a particular subject in math, statistics, physics, you name it, you know, a partic particular one, I should be able to find three five-minute videos on this particular topic. So just like with data, there's a, there are lessons to learn, um, one through five stars. There are also lessons to learn uh, through, uh, you know, we can, we can reuse that in educational resources. We all know that uh, open education is a lot more than just open educational resources. Those are a core, uh, core part of, of education, but there's, there's a lot more. And uh, when we talk about open government, talking with politicians, working on open policies, uh, open government as a theme is much, much bigger than just open government partnership, which is uh, an organization that, uh, that uh, put together countries which are working on, on openness. Now, I'm very happy that, that Jenwin introduced uh, the Action Lab, and we will uh, go a lot deeper into, into this, so I will only spend uh, a minute on, uh, on introducing what open government partnership is. Uh, first show of hands, how many of you uh, have heard about the Open Government Partnership before? Okay, so about, about a half. And um, it's, it's an international organization that basically put together countries to, to, work, uh, to work on openness. And they try to, try to uh, get commitments from, from these governments uh, to work on issues like civic participation, fight against corruption, and harnessing new technologies to promote openness. And uh, these are also the values of the Open Government Partnership. So logically, if you want to uh, promote openness, if you want to fight against corruption, you start with data. But there's so much more. And uh, just recently, the Open Government Partnership starting, started increasing its scope and, uh, and, and looked at the services that, uh, that the governments provide. So uh, one of these key services um, is education. Uh, when you look at the Slovak uh, open Government Partnership National Action Plan. Uh, we got open education as as a theme, and we were we were one of the one of the first countries uh, to do so. The United States is another one, and uh, there are also other countries that that are joining. And I see in the audience some of you who are working on this exact thing, either open education and open science. So uh, we uh, introduced open educational resources and open access in the action plan. And uh, the, we are just creating a new action plan for, for the next couple of years uh, where we will, we will increase the scope further. Again, uh, if you come to the Action Lab, we'll be very happy to, uh, to, to tell more about that. If this is something that, uh, that uh, you'll be interested in, you know, maybe you think, you know, this open government partnership is not a bad thing. The partnership is about the partnership between the government and the civil society. So it's not like the government is doing something. I, you may have noticed that I mentioned that I worked for the government in the past, 2014, 2015. I'm still involved. I no longer work with the government, but I'm still involved because it's partnership. Now I'm on the civil society side and still continue to work on that. 
So those of you who are not in the government, which is most of you, and who, who are on the civil society uh, part, you can still get involved with the government and work together. So how do you get involved? This week, um, there are several, several ways to do that. So uh, as we already heard, there's the, there's the Action Lab. So if you'd like to come, please do. Uh, if, there is, if there is more interest, we are happy to do uh, an unconference session on Friday. And uh, w gentlemen already mentioned that there's there's Hall, there, there's Hall, there, there there's Nickel, uh, there's there's myself. We'd be very happy to to uh, chat with you uh, during this week. But even after you leave the conference, there are many uh, many other ways to uh, to get involved. Uh, I work with organization uh, Spark, uh, and we organize monthly conference calls uh, on uh, on open education, and uh, you are you are invited to to, to join. In a, in a moment, I will show you uh, show you a website where you can where you can uh, uh, learn about uh, what what uh, we're doing and what are what are the ways to uh, to get involved. Every country has a point of contact uh, for open government issues. So, uh, if you'd like, you can reach out to them. Uh, they are there to uh, to to help you and to communicate with you. So uh, you can you can definitely do that. Now, the final issue. Why is this something that we should we should uh, even even uh, discuss? Why is it why is this worth your time? Uh, I think many of us in this room believe that there are some some ways in the system that are broken. Our system is broken in, in, in certain ways, and uh, it's 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 about time that we fix it. Education is an uh, is a very important public service. And there are ways to improve it. And we can we can be the ones who actually who actually can go ahead and um, and be a part of that. So I think it's important that we that we help fix the, fix the system. It's really important that uh, open government partnership as such provides a platform where we can where we can get together, where we can put together a coalition and work with the governments to to advance open education policies. And uh, those of you who are policymakers in this room, and there are a few of you. Uh, this is your, your chance to shine, your chance to be a part of this. So, so please uh, join, join the effort and, uh, and, and, and do your part if, if, if you're able. This is the website that uh, we, just, we just launched. Uh, if you go to opengopeducation.org, uh, you'll be able to, uh, to find some more information. What we're trying to build is, is, is a, is a uh, group uh, where we can where we can discuss uh, things where we can work together to to promote open education in uh, the OGP action plan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. So our next speaker is Anke Mulder. Anke is vice president at TU Delft, responsible for education operations since April 2013. Furthermore, she's a member of the edX University Advisory Board, a global network of universities including Harvard, MIT and Berkeley that produce MOOCs and promote innovation in education worldwide. She's a member of the Supervisory Board of the Hotel School The Hague and of the Comité d'Orientation Stratégique of the University of Sorbonne. From 2011 to 2013, Anke held the position of President of the Board of the International Open Courseware Consortium, the former name of the Open Education Consortium. From 2011 to 2013, she combined this post with that of Secretary General of the University. So when you're ready. Well, thank you very much. That was a very long introduction. Thank you very much for your introduction, and um, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Actually, when I was invited to give a keynote speech here, I had various reasons for coming here. But one of the most important reasons was to, uh, was, is the fact that I have so many friends and I see so many uh, familiar faces here, so great to be here. Um, when I prepared for this keynote speech, I asked my colleagues Martijn and Willem, what is new in the Open Education Consortium? So what is new? What should I be talking about? And they said, well, of course, there are new members. So uh, welcome to all the new members here. Um, there are more learners, which is good news, of course. But in fact, when I listened to what is happening in the Open Education uh, Consortium, I, and there were quite a number of issues that were, f were familiar to the times when I was acting on the board. For example, the consortium still needs more money. Unfortunately, nobody was there either. 
Of course, uh, I have, have heard a, a lot of interesting developments. Uh, one of the subjects you were talking about, open government, I think is a really interesting development happening in the open world. Uh, the other thing I think uh, are the great steps that we are taking in uh, setting now in open textbooks. Uh, I talked a little bit about that with uh, my old friend Hal Plotkin, uh, developing policies in, in uh, California about this, for example. So there are a number of really interesting developments, I think, in the open world, open education world. Um, but I have not been on the board for quite a number of years now. I'm now the vice president of a a brick-and-mortar campus uh, university. And I think uh, I can talk a lot more about uh, that is my experience today. Of course, I'm also active in open education and in MOOCs, but my world is the campus at the moment. So I was thinking perhaps I can talk a little bit about the parallels or the analogies there are between campus education and online and what I think should be the next or could be the next step in online education. Now, if I look at uh, the discussions that we are having at TU Delft, Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands right now, uh, we are currently talking about what our new vision on education should be for the next five or ten years. So, how do we as a technical university contribute to solving global challenges uh, in, in energy, in sustainability, etc., etc.? So, what does that mean for the profile of the future engineer? Should we think about different profiles or about how about our portfolio? Should we develop more multidisciplinary programs, for example? Um, also, of course, about how we integrate open and online education in our regular campus programs. So about the way we teach, how we should teach, how uh, we should develop our pedagogy. That is our discussion on the vision of education. But I will show you a picture of what the day of Anka normally looks like. This is a day in the life of Anka. So what you see here, for example, here on the left is um, I discuss traffic problems at on our campus. We have 22,000 students all on their bikes uh, cycling uh, to their courses at um, 8.30 in the morning, and that causes huge traffic problems. In the middle, you see uh, a rowing boat. So what I discuss a lot is uh, how we facilitate or give money to all types of student organizations. On the, on the far right, top right, you see uh, my discussions with uh, companies and business in the, in the region. I talk about, here on the left, developing courses, post-initial courses on nuclear security. In the middle, you see a picture on facilities, so workspaces for students. That's a hot topic for all our students on campus, and it's a subject I discuss very often with our student council. And here on the right, you see me and one of the aldermen of the city of Delft cutting a cake to celebrate the fact that we have free Wi-Fi in the center of Delft. Totally different subjects. And still, that should not be so surprising. Because I would like to do a little exercise with you, because it's early in the morning and you've had a, an interesting evening, I think. And now you can, just, you can just shut your eyes for just a second. Please shut your eyes. You're not shutting your eyes. Okay, shut your eyes and think about the time when you went to college or you went to university, perhaps five years ago, 20, 30 years or more. And they always say that your student days were the best years of your life. That's right, wasn't it? Now think about what defines best. Now you can open your eyes again. And I would like to ask you a question. If you think about the best time of your life as a student, was that about the lectures? Raise your hand, please. Yes, that was about the lectures. No? Was it about the, the, the books you read? Yeah, Fred, thank you. <laughs> one, one, one. Okay, it must have been about something else. Who would like to say what it was about? What's the first thing that pops up, what jumps to your mind? Yeah? Being with your friends. Being with your friends. As I heard people. Oh, beer with your friends. Oh, that's also a great answer. <laughs> beer with your friends. People, somebody else? You have to shout loud? Freedom. Freedom. So the thing is, it was about different things than we, that what, we, what we normally define as education. And I have also I have a picture about me at university. So when I went to university, I went to lectures, of course. I did my homework. 
uh, I had a social life. I met up uh, in, in for beers, perhaps with friends. I went to bars. I had coffees. Uh, I went to um, my sports clubs. Uh, I worked as well. I worked in a hospital. I worked in a bar, a hotel, uh, where I learned a lot as well. And, I, and yes, I also uh, washed dishes. And, of course, I had a boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is what we normally define as learning. This is extracurricular, so money, but also networking. And this is happiness. Now, we should not be uh, so surprised about this, because uh, what I believe, of course, my point is that a university education or learning is not about only about the curriculum. It's about m many more different things. I think it's not about only about the academy, it's also about the community. I can tell you that I learn a lot from washing dishes in a, in a restaurant. Um, perhaps some social skills, also the fact that that was not going to be my future and that I was going to work hard at university. I learned a lot from my friends. I learned from working in the, hosp in the hospital. I learned discipline. I learned lots of different things in my uh, activities outside the university, as well as the activities within the university. Now, of course, we know that learning is a social thing. It's a community thing. This is a picture you will find on, online everywhere, everywhere, and I think a lot of people will know it. What are This is the Maslow pyramid, so what are our real needs? And you can see we have basic needs, safety needs, social needs, etc., etc. And somebody put Wi-Fi at the bottom of that. I, I think, in fact, if you look at what is Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is an enabler of social. It's Facebook, it's, it's WhatsApp, etc., etc. So I think, actually, social needs should be right there with Wi-Fi. Now, the funny thing, though, is that if you look at campus discussions, and actually also about when we talk about online education, we focus a lot on the academy, not on the community. And I think, actually, that is a pity. Um, one thing I have noticed, especially on my campus, is this. That's the library. I think the library is, is uh, one of the typical examples or the typical pictures of what we have as a classical academy. It's where you go to when you go for books, when you want to learn. But it is, in fact, the library that has changed a lot, that has gone, undergone a profound change in the last 10 years. Can I check who, of, who among you works for a library? One, two. Three, four, five, yeah. I think if I look at my colleagues at the library, if digitalization has had any effect on the university, it, it is, has been there. So, what can we learn from that experience? Here you still, on the left, you see, oh, this is a picture of the beautiful library of TU Delft. You see, you still see a wall with lots of books. But in fact, hardly anybody comes to the library anymore to get a book. You bring your laptop, perhaps you already ha have bought some books, but the library there, uh, the library and uh, the wall of, of the books, the books are there mostly for decoration. Because people come to the library for different reasons. They come there to organize discipline to, to study, they come there for, with their friends to study, they come for coffee, they come for networking. Um, in fact, even if they don't come there anymore to borrow books, our library has never been as busy as it is today. In examination times, in when uh, students, in the weeks that students are preparing for their exams, it's packed. People queue up at a quarter to eight to find a space in the library which opens at eight and shuts at two o'clock at night. And uh, at two o'clock at night, the people who are uh, the guards of the library, they still have to pick up students from different corners of the library to make sure that they actually leave and go home. So, no books, well, there are some books. That's not the function anymore. The function now is, is networking. It has become a community thing. Now, how about online education? If I look at what we do at TU Delft online, it's about MOOCs, it's about courseware, open educational resources. Um, Willem yesterday gave a speech on the fantastic developments that we have at TU Delft with regard to MOOCs. Also, it's about learning analytics. But my point is that I think we're missing a vital part of education, which is the community. And I don't believe that should be necessary. Because like I said earlier on, digital is an enabler of social. It's an enabler of community. Yeah. 
Now, let's come back to the, 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 the vital parts of my uh, student life. I said it was about uh, content, it was about work experience, it was about networking, and it was about partner. And I think actually uh, quite a number of these things are also possible online. First of all, the content. In open education, in online education, we have tons of content. Content is not our challenge. I think we can tick that box. I think work experience, there are many examples that we can find that we could work on as well. For example, desktop publishing, tutoring, translating, washing dishes may be difficult, but other, other types of work experience are very much possible. Also networking. Perhaps a gym is difficult online, but gaming, chatting, etc. Perhaps the partner thing is the most difficult thing to organize online. Now, if you look around you in the online and the open world, I think there are already some interesting examples of exactly this, social community online. First of all, work experience. Here is an example that Willem found for me, which is uh, Mentiv. And Mentiv is a, a service for MOOC learners, uh, where MOOC learners uh, pay a little fee, a small fee, so they can get, uh, once a week, they can get tutoring online to help them um, uh, with the content, to help them uh, through their MOOC. So the tutor gets paid a little bit of money when he or she helps uh, MOOC learners with this service. And apparently this, this service can be provided in different languages, different time zones, and different countries. I think that's an interesting example. An example of networking that comes from my own university, which is called Delft Tulip. Tulip is a Ning site uh, which international students can join when they have decided to register at TU Delft. So once they've been admitted, they can join the Delft Tulip Ning site and they can do lots of things. They can post their hobbies, their pictures, their names, they can find friends, they can find, uh, for example, fellow students who are from the same country, they can find out about supermarkets, banking, uh, everything that, uh, 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 that may be confusing when you move to Delft. And the interesting thing is that even before they have, have actually moved to Delft, they have already acclimatized and they've already uh, built a whole set, a whole group of friends. So I think that's also an interesting example. Now, I mentioned that the partner thing may be the difficult thing to solve online, but even here I found a very interesting example, again from the Netherlands, but this time from the Open University, uh, uh, the Open University in the Netherlands. And I read an interview with the uh, Rector Magnificus Anja Oskamp, where she said that, um, that research, of course, has shown that very clearly that students learn better when they are, are in a relation. So based on their learning analytics system, they've uh, developed um, um, this platform where students can meet and perhaps date and find a partner. Interesting, huh? Well, note the date, 30th of March. So that was, of course, an April 1st joke. Huh? Thank you very much. But I think actually this may be possible in the future, who knows. Uh, on the plane to, um, to Krakow, I was thinking about other types of examples I could think of, of the community of social and online and open. And I wrote down, uh, for example, job search, or uh, where to go next for your full degree, or um, hangouts, digital hangouts, or alumni services, news services, Post course, Ning groups, etc., etc., etc. If we only use our imagination, I think it's very easy to find the community or the social things that we could add to the content of our courses. Now, I gave a speech, um, I think uh, about four months ago, at the OEB in Berlin, where I said um, that my vision for, for good universities, for proper higher education, if we want to live up to our mission, is that we should be open and global universities. So open to different types of learners, business, lifelong learners, regular students, online students worldwide, and also a global university, meaning globe open to talent wherever it comes from. And that is also what I believed um, these years ago when I was the president of this consortium. That was my ambition. So my message for you would be, let's be an open campus, um, face-to-face -face and online, an open campus, a global campus, and a social campus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anka.
So our third speaker is uh, Lisa Blaschke, a program director of the Master of Distance Education and E-Learning, the MDE graduate program at Karl von Notzieski Universität Oldenburg, Germany, as well as an associate professor, professor within the MDE at the University of Maryland University College in the United States. She's a vice president and executive committee member of the European Distance Education and E-Learning Network, EDEN, and an EDEN Fellow. Her research interests are in the areas of lifelong and self-determined uh, learning, hutagogy, and the pedagogical application of Web 2.0 technologies. Okay. okay, thank you for that introduction. Uh, as uh, was said, I'm Lisa Marie Blaschka from the University of uh, Oldenburg, and uh, I'm going to be talking to you uh, today about opening up Europe uh, through strategy and the added value of uh, collaborations. I want to start out, though, first with, um, with a quote that came from the COL uh, meeting that was held last month uh, in, in March, uh, where it was stated that, in general, ODL institutions have not played a leadership role in either the OER movement or in developing MOOCs. Open universities have yet to adopt and appropriate these emerging options. Now, I'm sure there's some of you in this room who don't agree with this quote, uh, and I'd like to uh, present to you today uh, three different universities, open distance uh, learning universities that I did research on during the last uh, last few months, uh, where we talked about their OER strategies. How did they go about implementing OER initiatives? And what I hope will come out of this is that you will see that perhaps there is an opportunity for these universities to be recognized as leaders. Uh, and that's something that we support through Eden. Okay, the first university that I would like to talk about is Athabasca University. Now, Athabasca University is the home of the COL UNESCO uh, Chair of OER, Rory McGreal, who also received an OEC uh, Lifetime Achievement Award last night. Rory, if you could stand up. I can see you over there in the corner. If you... If you have questions about Athabasca and how it implements uh, OERs within its organization, um, I would highly recommend that you talk to Rory afterwards. Um, I'm only going to be giving you a short preview and overview of the different uh, approaches that were used here. Um, the goal at Athabasca was really to um, to lower costs and speed up delivery of uh, course design and, and uh, course development. And they did this by using teams of learning de designers, subject matter experts, visual designers, uh, and they did this through um, using champions within their organization as well as workshops. And they had a bottom-up, top-down approach uh, within their management where they didn't just have uh, things just kind of happening uh, you know, where they, where it was just done by the professors. And Rory has been a, a, a real voice within the institution and has been guiding them along the way. Now, there isn't really a strategy in the sense of a written strategy um, a, about how it will be or an agreed upon strategy. This is how we're going to implement OERs. However, the management at Athabasca, the leadership at Athabasca, has shown their commitment to OERs through the support of Rory in the initiative at Athabasca. So what have been some of the results of this OER uh, initiative? Increased number of OERs, increased awareness of OER, uh, and of course more use of the Open Library and the AU Press, which are open access publishing at Athabasca. Um, and then here are some of the benefits of uh, OER. There was more faculty collaboration that occurred as a result of, uh, of the initiative. Um, both in and out of institutions where where faculty was uh, co where they were actually collaborating with others outside of the institution, uh, and then there was less de dependency on commercial uh, publishers. And in addition, uh, students were also becoming more involved in creating and designing their own OERs. Now the next example that I have is University of Maryland University College, uh, and and I full disclosure as was mentioned, I work for University of Maryland University College as a fa as a faculty member, um, and know this firsthand some of the experience of transitioning to OER. Uh, we're actually going through this process within the graduate school at the moment. Uh, the University of Maryland University College started this uh, initiative uh, about two years ago, and the goal was to reduce. This, uh, the cost for students in terms of uh, textbook costs and to provide them with uh, savings that would help them in, um, in, in 
in, their, in managing their debt uh, in pursuing their education. In addition, there was also um, a need for having mobile, uh, uh, downloadable, accessible uh, OERs that they could use uh, for their courses. A, lar a, a large base of uh, UMBC students, um, they are in the military, and so they need to have access to, uh, to, the, um, to the course resources uh, by downloading them so they can't just access them online. They don't always have access uh, to online uh, documents. And so this is for around 84,000 students. So the initial goal was really to reduce textbook costs, which in the United States, I think they, they calculate around $1,200 a year uh, in textbook costs uh, for students. Um, now what they did was they used a team approach with uh, instructional designers, working with the people from the library, uh, as well as with faculty. Um, the results of that, well, first of all, they were able to transition 700 courses within, over 700 courses within the undergraduate program, as well as uh, save over $10 million annually uh, for their students in terms of textbook cost savings, which I think is a pretty, pretty big number. I mean, that has a, has, I think it has a real big impact in terms of savings. Uh, what also happened, which was which I found to be very interesting, and which wasn't really an, an expectation of the initiative, was that as they moved along and they started to to move into OERs and to transition to OERs, what they found was that their curriculum became more learner centered. When they started, they initially thought, well, we'll just swap out what we have now in our textbooks, and we'll just throw in something that's online. Well, they realized they weren't able to do that. What they had to do was they had to sit down and really think about what kind of learning outcomes do we want to achieve here? How are we going to go about it doing, doing it? And what resources are available to support us? And as a result, they had to become more learner-centered in their approach, uh, which, is a, which is a really uh, neat approach. And by the way, the, uh, UMBC was also the winner of the OEC 2015 President's Award last year. So the last example that I have uh, in my research and uh, this was through Open Learn, through the Open University of UK, which was placed first place in, open, in the Open Courseware Provider League table. Um, I think in January that was. Uh, and Andrew Lane is here. If you want to talk to Andrew about Open Learn, he's right over there. Uh, and he'd be happy to talk to you about it. I was really excited about this approach, this particular strategic approach to, to implementing OER, because I think they took a real um, management uh, perspective when they approached this because they looked at not just the KPIs, uh, not just not just you know what do we want to do here in terms of OER. They looked at the at the full value chain. They looked at inbound <coughs> inbound logistics. They looked at the operations. They looked at the impact on marketing sales, uh, and so they they took it all into consideration. And what was the value added? Now the project started uh, as a result of Hewlett um, Initiative uh, back in the 2000s and where they approached the OU UK and said, you know, do you want, are you interested in producing OER? And so they said, sure, we'll do that. Now, what they then did was they looked at, you know, how can we do this? How can we realize OER within the institution? And what what they came up with as, was a really well-defined OER policy um, that and, and that positioned OERs within the institution across the value chain. Uh, and I would really recommend, this is available online, that you take a look at this if you haven't had an opportunity to, because they've really defined some key issues that, that you, you need to have, I think, within your OER policies um, in terms of, you know, how are we going to handle our partnerships? What kind of business models are we going to use? How are we going to use our channels? And so these are all some examples of, of how they went about implementing um, open, uh, open educational resources within their organization. Now, I also want to add that one of the key things, as I mentioned before, was the KPIs and the metrics that were used. Now, now for some of you, this may be like, well, why, why do I need KPIs? Why do I need metrics? Well, management needs to hear that kind of talk from us. They need to hear from us, how are we going to save money in the organization? How are we going to make money within the organization by using OERs? Where is the value added? And so what I think that, that Open Learn has done quite successfully uh, is, they've, is they've looked at you know, how, can we, how can we add value through OERs. And they've done this through their MOOCs, where the, where, through, the, through the MOOCs where they actually have channeled informal students over a thousand a year to becoming formal students. And that means, that means money for the, for the institution. Uh, so that's, that's another example. 
So what did all of these three institutions have with each other? I know the, uh, the, the, the topic today is opening up Europe, uh, but I think a lot of what I'm talking about today doesn't just apply uh, to uh, you know, the United States and Canada, it also applies to what's happening here in Europe. Context is a very important thing. This is also something that's come up in a lot of the discussions that I've had during the, during the uh, conference so far, uh, also during the strategy discussion that was held yesterday about OERs. Uh, context is just really, really important in defining how you're going to approach OER. So what was common amongst them? The mission, the, the OER strategy, the OER initiative, it aligned with the mission of the institution. There was sustainability and flexibility. They had to consider how are we going to have, how are we going to sustain this initiative within the institution? And uh, you know, as I mentioned before, a good example was what Open Learn is doing with their KPIs and their metrics. Then they had to look at what are the, what's the value added? How are we going to measure where we're adding value through our OERs? So, you know, a lot of us, I think, start with the idea of, well, we want to have OER. It's a great idea. We want to be open. Uh, but we have to think like management. How are we going to get management to agree with us and to buy into the idea of using OER? And that's where strategy comes in. So these were really three of the key elements. Now, what does that have to do with the next part of my discussion, which is a collaboration? You know, how can we realize this? I want to go back to the, the quote that we had uh, previously from the president of so C COL. And one of the things that none of these institutions had when they went about, or organizations, when they went about uh, with a, a introducing an OER strategy, is th they didn't have a, a model to follow. They didn't know how to go about it. There weren't any strategies out there where they could say, ah, that's exactly how I want to do it. Or I'm going to take this model and I'm going to eh, maybe you know, make a few changes here and there. Uh, and so they didn't really have a model. They didn't really have, you know, an opportunity to, to access a model. Now, I think that these three institutions, that they, they could provide, they could be leaders within uh, ODL, and they could also provide us with models that could be used in other institutions, not just within their own institutions. And so now I'm going to go to the next part, which is about awareness and promotion. In order to really establish these institutions uh, further as being leaders within ODL, to really show the work that they've done within open education, open educational resources, we need to have more awareness, we need to have more promotion. And we can do that through collaborations and partnerships. And the uh, collaboration and partnership that I would like to talk about briefly is the OEC and Eden partnership, which was just recently signed uh, just a few weeks ago. And this partnership really has evolved over time. Um, Eden is, uh, is an organization, uh, the European Distance Education e-learning network, the OEC. We both have very similar missions. We want to support and promote OERs, open education, within Europe and around the world. And so we have similar missions. So the partnership, is, I think, can be very successful because we have those similar missions. We're both interested in sustainability and flexibility. Eden has been uh, sustaining, uh, uh, I guess, posi has had a sustaining position throughout the throughout the open education movement from the very start. For example, uh, some of the uh, of the leaders of the open university back in the 70s, you know, Tony Bates. Um, <clears throat> Tony Bates, John Daniel, uh, and then Otto Peters from the Fan, Fan Universität, they were all people that were involved in the open, edu in the open education movement early on, and they were also founders of Eden uh, back in the uh, 1970s. So we, we have a history of sustainability, we, and we want to work together to try to promote, uh, promote openness, uh, not just within Europe, but, but throughout the world. What we also have to have within our strategy of being a partner is we need to have we need to show where there's value added, uh, and one of the thing, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that next. Okay, what is the Eden mission? Just to give you an overview of what what we're doing and what what we see as our Eden uh, as our mission. And I'm not going to go into this in 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 detail. We modern modernizing education, recognizing excellence through our different programs that we offer, much like what what you did yesterday evening uh, with the with the certificates and awards. Networking, collaborating, collaborating. Uh, improving understanding uh, about openness, about online education, promoting policy and practice through involvement in a number of EU projects, and also preserving the legacy of online distance learning uh, that has been established. 
So our members are really our key and our fundamental, are, are, are really our core assets. Uh, and so these are institutional members, individuals, and networks. And this is just a few examples of, of the numbers that we have in terms of uh, members within Eden. And so really, through this partnership, we want to be able to provide our, our members with, you know, with really value through, through our, uh, through our um, partnership. And one of the things I would like to members we uh, mention is that we also have a network um, of academics and professionals, which we call the NAP, which we uh, use for collaboration, uh, and our members use for collaboration and for sm uh, forming small communities online. So, strategy, extending the reach. What can the OEC, OER, uh, uh, the, uh, the OEC Eden uh, partnership, how can it extend the reach through our strategy of creating this partnership? Well, we're providing new communication channels. We'll be able to use a lot more channels uh, to send information out. We're having, for example, our Eden conference, uh, annual conference, 25 years of Eden, uh, will be held in Budapest from the June 14th to the 17th. I know I have to put that plug in there. Um, and we will be inviting uh, the OEC to come and 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 to serve on a key on a keynote panel uh, and and to promote uh, OER and open education at our at our conference. Uh, we also have networks for creating partnerships and and alliances, and of course we are uh, deeply involved in many of the uh, EU programs, policies, uh, and projects, which are shown here to the right. So what's the added value for these three institutions? How can we help these institutions, the three that I just talked about at the beginning in terms of strategy? All three of these are Eden members. And so what we want to do is we want to be able to help them by connecting them with other institutions, by giving them an opportunity to share their experiences, to really provide guidance for others that might be entering into the OER uh, jungle and want to have some kind of model to follow. Uh, and also as well to develop, help develop policies and standards and share their best practices uh, and strategies. And also their models for openness, I think, is also very important. So finally, uh, some paths to opening up Europe, uh, where I see uh, the three of uh, the, the, the OER, the OEC and the Eden uh, partnership helping to promote that uh, is, is to really promote the value of openness and broadcasting our successes together, uh, creating platforms for dialogues around research uh, and practice, and making them open, provide, making these strategies open, making these best practices open for others, for our members uh, to have access to them and to learn from them, and also then to maximize the potential of these alliances and partnerships, uh, not just within open and distance learning, uh, but also across a number of different disciplines. So that's all I had today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. So to sum up, we could say we've seen the need for open policies for data, software, and uh, education. And when drawing up open policies for open and online uh, education, it's important to remember social issues. There's more to, going, there's more to getting a degree and a certificate than um, in education. It's also about, as Anka told us, it's also about socialization and uh, uh, personal development. And we've also seen the importance of partnerships at governmental level with the Open Government Partnership and at institutional level, uh, the partnership between Eden and OEC. So by forging uh, partnerships between our um, educational institutions, we'll be in a stronger position to further open an online education. So I'd say all of these issues are key elements for moving towards an open culture. So we have about 10, 15 minutes for uh, questions from the audience. So who would like to break the ice? Yeah? I have a, a question about the UMUC initiative. Uh, the cost savings are so amazing at such a large scale program. Do you have any uh, evidence on efficacy, what's happened to student grades or dropout rates, things like that as a result of the open adoption? It. 
Okay. Um, initial results, they did, do, uh, they, they did do analytics. They did analyze the data in terms of was there an impact on student performance? Um, did they uh, perform better? Did they perform worse? Was there a higher dropout rate? And there was no, there, there was no identifiable, identifiable uh, change in, how, in, in what happened. So there was, there was no change in, in implementing OERs in, in terms of, of that aspect in terms of dropout rates and completion rates and, and quality of, of education for the student, I think. So. Well, thank you, Lisa, for your reference to those three examples, uh, the OU in the UK, UMUC in the US, and the Canadian Open University Athabasca. Known them pretty well, I would like to modestly add an example from the Global South, uh, which is the National Open University of Nigeria, who just recently decided to become a fully OER-based open university. And to my knowledge, it's the first one in the world. Not the OU in the UK, not Athabasca, not the OU in the Netherlands, but Nigeria is taking the lead. Uh, so I would just like to share with you this example. I'm very happy with reference to those examples and the struggle that open universities have had in the last decade with the OER uh, developments. Uh, and uh, some, of doing, uh, some of them are doing very well, some are really still struggling with the, uh, with the new um, uh, emergence of digital openness. But the Nigerian National Open University, I think, is an interesting example. And to me, it's striking that Africa uh, is giving this example to all of us. The Global South is uh, also um, on track, more or less. I'd also like to add that UNISA was the only institution that I found, University of South Africa, that I was able to find where they actually publicized their strategy online. Uh, I wasn't able to find another institution that publicized their strategy outside of the OU policy paper. Thank you, and thank you for a very interesting presentation, for good examples, and I also agree with you that Asha has to modify her statement, and I guess she will, with pleasure. She is a great promoter of MOOCs and uh, Open Education Resources. My name is Gal Tetlista, and I'm Secretary General of International Council for Open and Distance Education, and Open came into the name of ICD in the 1980s. So ICD as an organization has a long and proud history of promoting openness, both in the broad sense and also in the OER sense, as you might know. So I thought I would add to your examples a couple, which <laughs> all work on OER, and even they are not 100% OER universities, except for, okay, obviously, the OER university led by uh, Wayne Mac McIntosh in New Zealand, and there are examples like in, in South America, uh, which also is represented here, which are strong on OER. It is, of course, UNISA, as you mentioned, but you should also mention African Virtual University, which is the key provider of OER. And, uh, well, there is a long list, to be honest, uh, which all are very uh, much into OER, and to complete your picture. And they, what is also a characteristic for many of them, they are also into the provision of distance education. So I agree with you, Asha, which also is on the executive committee uh, of ICD, has to modify <laughs> her statement, and we should all join up in partnership for the good sake. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Jan Gondel, are there indicators of uh, this uh, wonderful project of uh, open governments that the project would expect uh, from the governments, how they would be opening up? Do you have any concrete examples of these indicators and do you think public education as public good is possible today? The second part is, is an interesting one, <laughs> is, uh, if it's possible. We can, we can have a philosophical discussion over coffee about that. When it comes to uh, what the governments do, um, there's a very interesting range of what is happening within uh, the Open Government Partnership. 
Uh, the way it works, there are two-year national action plans, and uh, every government comes up with their own. And uh, there are currently 69 countries involved in OGP, and uh, they have uh, these plans that they set for, set for themselves. And they walk, they walk the walk. You know, they don't just talk about these things, but they also publish all these commitments. So you can even find um, an, um, a spreadsheet where, where you will find an overview of, of, of all these uh, commitments. Uh, open education is something new that, that that's happening here. Um, there are also a number of very interesting ideas, and because innovation is one of the four core values of OGP, there's a lot of interesting uh, stuff happening. So if you'd like to uh, look into what what uh, what can happen within OGP, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to to look at those commitments and also come up with with uh, with your own. Maybe you know we, we did a little experiment. Uh, it's it's a, it's effects still remain to be seen. There was no uh, open education just a couple of years ago. Uh, now there is, and we will see how, how this develops. So if you're interested in you know, uh, promoting openness in, in various areas, I think there, there's, there's plenty of room to do that. <coughs> Maybe this is not a question as much as a comment. Um, stimulated by Anka Mulder, uh, and I was going to answer her question, but then I was shy, I didn't. Um, but uh, just in context, um, my name is Alex Romyshovsky, and uh, um, with a Polish name, but I'm a retired professor from Syracuse University. Uh, I still teach online. In fact, right now I'm teaching adult learning. This morning already I was online with students in the US. Um, and I happen to have a very small group in that course, six students. Uh, we had a very big fight in our department, instructional design, development, evaluation, to have six and five students on a graduate course, because 10 is the minimum number for a course not to be canceled. But we showed quite clearly that the cost of an online course don't make sense, to, but the same as on campus. So we can get away with any number now on online courses, which means a very close relationship with the students. And in fact, uh, of the six students, two are so-called student athletes. I don't know whether you United States people know this very well. They're there to st with a scholarship to, to for sports, and they happen to have to study something. They're not very much involved. And in fact, one of the two uh, is in the basketball team that f lost the final in the March Madness, as it was called, the National Inter-University Championship. So she wasn't around very much during this semester so far. <laughs> but we managed to keep in touch, even though she was turning around. Now, that's a level of interactivity that I have not experienced, to go to Anka's question, since my own student days in the 1950s at Oxford University, very traditional university. but. I, that was the highest level of interactivity that I'd experienced in university courses until online courses recently with small numbers. Um, I had a personal tutor throughout three years of undergraduate study. He was the same one. I changed from physics to engineering, kept the same tutor, and he told me, don't go to this guy's lectures because it's not worth it. Read his book. <laughs> it's quicker and more effective, and so on. Uh, indeed, not only for that reason, but also because I was very much involved in the extracurricular and happiness activities. Um, I was not a fantastic undergraduate student, uh, and in some semesters, I didn't go to a single lecture. But one thing I did always do is go to the laboratory activities, because if you didn't do them on Mondays, 3 o'clock, because that was your slot, you wouldn't do them any time. And so the practical activities, could have been added to the learning, as well as books and so on. Plus, um, this aspect of interactivity, uh, it, 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 it existed in uh, medieval universities. It doesn't exist in com typical universities today. But online can bring it back. Thanks. Now it works. 
Well, thank you very much for your comment. And, uh, and I, of course, I do believe that interaction during lectures or during the, edu the learning part of education is very important. And at the same time, and well, you mentioned your uh, uh, activities beyond the curriculum. I, I think those constitute to uh, becoming an adult or, or learning something as well. And I think that is true for campus students as well as online students. And I think my point would also be that we, instead of broadcasting or understanding, sort of knowing in advance what our learners uh, want and expect from us, but perhaps we should ask them. And um, then we will probably find out it, it is about the contents because a, a lot of the learners will want to know something about physics or mathematics or whatever. But I think uh, we will also find out, we may find out that quite a number of them um, want other things from us as well. That they want to set up a network perhaps with uh, fellow students or share knowledge with or share information or uh, perhaps find a job in a particular area. So my point would be that interaction is of course vital in education, but I think if we want to take the, set the next step for this movement, we have to look be beyond the contents and also think about other activities. Thank you. Is, is that working, Anka? Yeah. Okay. Um, Anka, two things. Um, first of all, Tony Cochran from the British Open University. I'm really interested in the notion of the relational between the students and the networking. It feels like that we have worked out um, with books and materials how the open equivalent looks. We know what that is. So there's a the value transaction is quite clear to us. We see that books cost money, and the open source stuff is usually free. The open education stuff is usually free. For the networking, the the um, financial exchange is different. Um, to use social networks, we pay with our data, with our the information about our lives. What does the open education equivalent of social networking look like? Does that make any kind of sense at all? You know, we don't pay Facebook, we don't pay Twitter. What we pay with is with our personal details about our lives. I haven't solved that bit yet. <laughs> But what I mean, what I thought was, um, why are big universities so? Why why does everybody want to go to the Ivy League universities, or perhaps even to my university, or to the big uni not to Oxford? You, you studied in Oxford. I think part of that is uh, is because you learn a lot there. Uh, so the value of uh, the content value of the of the diploma. But if we, we all know, it's also partly it's the network, it's the um, uh, it's the people you know um, that is that also defines the value of that particular diploma. So that is one of the reasons why people want to go to Harvard, to MIT, to Oxford, Cambridge. It's both. So I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could set something up like that um, uh, online as well for those people who cannot join these top universities but do want to learn something and do not only want to learn something but have this valuable network that will help them in their careers. And I'm not sure, I mean, uh, data protection or do we pay with our data? I'm, uh, I'm not sure about how to solve that bit, but I'm convinced that this networking part is vital. Thank you, uh, Anka Malda, for a very nice presentation. I'm probably going to uh, comment on uh, one, one thing you raised, uh, which I somehow tweeted, and the, there were some comments on it. So uh, some, oftentimes, education, when we talk about education equality, people say, it's not only about learning. It's also about those you know, kind of entertainment networks. But there are networks everywhere, even in developing countries. There are networks. People meet in pubs, they networks, but they are not learning. And actually, the outcome of defining equality in terms of network, that entertainment, those gyms, you know, which are there, what leads to it's hiking the tuition fee and lead to exclusion of 
uh, an overwhelming majority of people in many countries. And that's where the comment from, uh, I think, someone from uh, Delft, uh, I, I will not be able to pronounce your name, but he commented that in the EU, tuition fee is, uh, let's say, uh, 1,900 no, 1, euros. Uh, we know EU is doing very well. In many countries, is even tuition, uh, there's no tuition fee. But in many other countries, it's really an issue, a serious issue. And if we look at the issue globally, uh, so we find that that kind of defining court in terms of those entertainment lead to uh, uh, exclusion of an overwhelming majority of learners who are willing to learn and they uh, uh, cannot afford it. And I, I find many underdeveloped countries, for instance, where access to higher education is even less than 5% of second education graduates. And this leads to another question, is a public education and a, a, a public good enough? From a global perspective, no, that's what I tweeted. Because um, uh, it's, it's an exclusive privilege, obviously, for the very few top kind of privileged. So it's, it's really we need to look at the issue globally. And probably the failure, what I see as the failure of the open education movement, is w when I see the report, I see we have these million downloads, we have these likes. I haven't seen anyone who say we have used these resources to create educational opportunities for this number of people who had not been included otherwise. So that's the kind of result which we would probably like to see. Thank you. Um, I'm, a, I'm a pragmatic person and I'm an idealist, and um, which is, I mean, I think the latter part has been the reason, the most important reason for me to be active in this movement. And if I can um, just get into the point you make about exclusion, I, I think exclusion to education is appalling. And, um, and, but at the same time, I see that tu there are tuition fees. I mean, in some, at some universities, tuition fees are really high. At other universities, they're quite low. I think in the Netherlands, 1,900 euros, uh, that's relatively low. But, you know, it's still higher than being education being for free in some other countries. But to come back to my point of, uh, of networks, uh, I think people have, um, for, for, for your career, for the future, for your future, for your working life, it is important that you have access to education. But I think this network, having ac access to a relevant network that may help you with a career, that friends or colleagues who will sh point out the jobs, who would tell their colleagues, well, this person, Lisa, is a fantastic colleague, you should really hire her. I mean, I think we should also focus on um, uh, the exclusion to that sort of network, those sort of networks, which is what is happening today as well. So this is one of the points I wanted to make in my speech. Let's focus on providing content for an affordable price or for free. Open content is really important. But the next step, open um, uh, networks, uh, I think is is perhaps ev is perhaps even as important. So that uh, really advice. My advice would be, let's take that next step as well. Would you like? To so thank you very much for your questions and con contributions. We've no more time. I suggest that if you still uh, have questions, to speak to the uh, to talk to the speakers during the coffee break. Before we close the session, Jan Kusiak would like to give the speakers a small gift on behalf of the, the university. Um, I just wanted to mention that anyone who's interested in Open Learn uh, and their what they've done over the last two, ten years, they're actually they're celebrating their ten year anniversary this year. Uh, there will be a session uh, this afternoon, so be sure to attend that if you're interested. Thank you.